All right, it's 11 a.m., so uh, we're going to get started. I want to uh, welcome everybody today and thank you for joining us for uh, today's webinar. Today is the third installment in a series that uh, Nelson Hardiman has been uh, presenting on uh, tele related to telemedicine abortion issues. Uh, we, with the presentation today is litigation risks of uh, telemedical abortion, uh, analyzing criminal and civil litigation risks um, in the post-ops era. Uh, I'm excited to be joined for this webinar by my, my partner and the co-founder of our firm, Mark Hardiman. Uh, by the way, let me just say for anybody who's listening who has not uh, had a chance to see our previous webinars, which were focusing more on the regulatory issues and providing an introduction to the topic with Dr. Beth Raymond, uh, please reach out directly to our firm at info at Nelson Hardiman and we can provide those. So I'm excited to be joined by my partner, uh, Mark Hardiman today. Mark is a former federal prosecutor and uh, uh, has worked extensively in the area of uh, criminal defense and healthcare matters, as well as in government investigations and civil administrative issues. So uh, Mark brings a litigation perspective uh, a, a, that is uh, much broader than what we've touched on so far. So there is gonna be some return to issues that we've covered on past webinars, but, but with a much deeper focus. So, uh, I'll skip over our bios, but you can read those. We will be glad to share the slides after this uh, presentation. And so, uh, and by the and just one comment: uh, we, we this series is continuing. We are currently planning for September twenty first, uh, four weeks forward, uh, a webinar focused on privacy issues in telemedicine abortion. And then, and as always, we are uh, receptive to suggestions for other programs that relate to our law firm's expertise as a healthcare life science firm to focus on, uh, in particular, telemedicine abortion. So just as an overview of today's program, uh, we're going to be covering a series of issues here uh, related to litigation risk, and we've tried to bifurcate those. I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Mark, do you want to walk us through what, what, what we're going to talk about today? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to discuss why telemedical uh, abortion is likely to be the legal ba battlefield, both on the criminal front and on the civil front uh, in abortion ban states. And then we're going to specifically look at using Texas as an example, which is the largest abortion ban state in, in, in the country. Looking at their law laws in, in detail, they tend to mimic uh, or be mimicked by other abortion ban states. So that will give us a perspective on what the law says and how they're likely to be enforced. And then we're gonna discuss potential liability for out-of-state um, providers of, of medical abortions or telemedical abortions. What type of realistic uh, risks does an out-of-state provider in a permissive state have in treating a patient that uh, resides and or takes the medication that is prescribed in the permissive state back in an abortion ban state. What does that create in terms of liability for the healthcare provider, such as the physician, the pharmacist, who actually dispenses it pursuant to a valid prescription in the permissive state? And then we will also take a brief look at potential liability for employers and healthcare plans that offer healthcare coverage in the abortion ban state and what are the likely limits going to be to that and what risks of criminal and civil liability does an employer or a health plan face if they decide as many of the large employers Yelp, Citibank, Amazon uh, uh, decide to extend benefit or assistance in traveling to a permissive state to get an abortion. What is the likely impact on them to the extent that they do business in the abortion ban state. And hopefully at the end, we will have um, uh, uh, some time for to take some questions from you all. I also want to say, by the way, if people have questions as we're going, please do put them into the Q&A uh, box that's available. We'll do our best to uh, take questions up, uh, relevant questions up as we're going and certainly uh, try to address them at the end. On the past webinars, we'll try to, as we've done, on the past ones, uh, it, it, actually, to the extent that we can address questions, will uh, circulate to attendees uh, answers 
Um, and, and in doing so, I just want to include the disclaimers that we are make, providing this webinar for educational purposes and not to constitute, uh, this webinar is not uh, intended to be legal advice, it's not intended to be relied upon to the extent we say anything clinical as medical advice. The opinions uh, that we're expressing are our own and not of any other organization. And uh, when you're considering, if you are an individual or an organization uh, plotting your course forward, we always recommend that you consult with, uh, with, with counsel in doing so. Yeah, this disclaimer, we, we have it in all our presentations, but it's particularly apropos this subject because uh, this presentation is gonna involve a lot of, of tea leaves looking and looking into the crystal ball uh, in terms of the post Dobbs world. And it's probably going to take years for the state and federal courts to determine the pre precise parameters and limitations on criminal and civil liability in abortion ban states, especially vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, providers and, uh, and patients that travel to a permissive state to obtain an abortion that is actually banned in their state of residence. Terrific. All right, so we're going to jump in. The first topic is is telemedicine abortion access and ban in restriction states. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we anticipate that the primary legal battlefield regarding state abortion bans is likely to be what we've been discussing in private webinar uh, uh, sessions, which is telemedical or in-person mifepristone, misoprostol abortions during the first 12 weeks of abortion. And the reason for that uh, is, is pretty obvious. In abortion banned states, in the basically the half of the states that have or seem very likely to implement abortion banned states in the near, near future, legal surgical abortions will be unavailable in those states. And late term pregnant uh, women are much more therefore likely to travel to a permissive state than to, to try to get a backstreet abortion in the, in, in, in the abortion ban states. At the front end, we can anticipate that residents in abortion ban states, given the access through telemedicine, et cetera, are likely to, to, to use or uh, attempt to obtain a medical abortion remotely. And they, they're already, there's already evidence that they, they're doing so because they can get around um, pro, you, you know, restrictions imposed by the abortion ban states by falsifying their location, by using a relative in a permissive state to get the medications and then having the medications forwarded them to them where they reside in the abortion ban state. So there's likely to be a lot of activity in the abortion ban states about how they can restrict the remote accessing through telemedicine of, of medical uh, abortions uh, online. That being said, policing telemedical abortions in abortion banned states is gonna be challenging. Uh, you typically identifying the occurrence of a telemedical ab uh, 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 abortion will be, in the abstract, will be generally impossible. So you're gonna have a situation where, unless there's a witness someone who reports a resident in an abortion ban state and says that they think this person is pregnant and they're, they, they have either had a telemedical abortion or an, an intending to do, it's unlikely that law enforcement is going to go very proactive in terms of actively trying to find uh, pregnant women in the abortion ban state who are considering or have actually undergone uh, a medical uh, uh, abortion in that state, absent some triggering event. Now, one significant caveat to this presentation is we're just looking at the abortion specific laws in, in the various states. We are, we are not looking at aggressive prosecutors that may look to traditional murder laws or feticide laws in their state to go after the patients themselves. And, and it's important to remember that as we discuss the laws, because a, a, a significant limitation on the laws, including the, 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 the liability of providers, is that most states do not criminalize the pregnant woman's obtaining an abortion. 
So all the, these particular laws generally target the providers, not the pregnant woman uh, herself. And you'll, we'll, we'll discuss why that's particularly important with respect to the liabilities uh, of the providers. So uh, way, you, two, yeah, go ahead. Just two comments I want to make. First, we had a we had a comment uh, by one of the listeners, Mark. The late term abortion is a uh, a political term used by anti-abortion forces. The appropriate we we let's refer to second and third trimester abortions. Also, the, I just want to make a comment. The slide uh, refers to twelve weeks of uh, of pregnancy, a use of uh, of uh, Miffy and Miso Prostol, and uh, that, just to be clear, the FDA protocol specifically states uh, uh, use up to uh, 10 weeks of gestational age. And so um, there's that, that's a, a distinct issue I just wanted to clarify. Sure. So you, you all may remember, just as an example of, of non-specific use of other uh, violent crime laws, such as murder statutes. In 2015, there was an Indiana woman, Pervy Patel, who was actually sentenced to 20 years in prison in, after she was accused and convicted of feticide and neglect of a child after allegedly inducing her own abortion. And in that case, they actually relied on, on texts and, and social media communications that she had a fr with a friend of hers talking about getting um, medication and, uh, and pills to induce that abortion. So that risk of an aggressive prosecutor going out of outside the specific uh, uh, abortion directed laws to bring in the ordinary murder statutes or or feticide statutes or um, uh, child neglect statutes is pretty real. But but as I said, we're going to focus on the recently enacted specific abor abortion ban laws. So in short, subject to something we're going to talk about in just a second, which are these civil bounty hunters or private attorney general uh, statutes. Law enforcement generally, uh, I do not believe that they're going to engage in wholesale sort of geofence warrants or actively go out and troll for women in their state that may have had an abortion. I could, I could be wrong about that. You could never count the fervor of certain prosecutors in abortion ban states, but I suspect that the test cases are going to be those where there is some trigger rather than than an active search, some trigger in terms of a witness uh, or 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 a private citizen reporting a resident in the abortion ban state for a, get being pregnant and either intending to get a medical abortion or actually having obtained one, and that's what's likely to tri trigger the criminal cases and civil cases against the providers of that particular abortion. I'll also point out to, um, that uh, in terms of controlling the actual influx of, of, uh, of the medications into an abortion ban state, that's an impossible task for the state. They, the, most of them have, have, have already passed laws restricting the mailing or distribution of uh, Nithia and Miso in abortion ban states. But the reality is as shown by just regular illegal controlled substances that are distributed by the mail, whether it's FedEx, United States Postal Service, the state cannot actually access uh, most of, of those and do, do warrantless searches of mail coming into an abortion ban state. And the, the various studies have shown that even with stuff like cocaine or heroin, uh, drug dealers have an 85% chance of getting a successful delivery uh, without law enforcement intervention for, for th those illegal drugs. So it seems very unlikely that there's going to be a high risk of um, those drugs for uh, the abortion medications actually being um, stopped at the border, if you will. The, those will be easily mailed into abortion ban states. So having sort of set the stage, what I wanted to do is look at the Texas laws. Texas has got a, a, a something like 29 million people. So it's the largest state that has abortion ban. It's been particularly aggressive with respect to enacting its laws. And a lot of other states mimic the laws passed by Texas. Um, the, the weirdly, 
they've had old Texas laws dating back to 1934 in place that have been carried forward. And now that Dobbs uh, uh, decision came down, those laws are actually in effect. The, the, what I'm calling the old Texas criminal laws under their health and safety code. And those laws knowingly prohibit uh, the administering or procuring for administration of a medication for abortion as a felony that is punishable by two to five years in prison. There's also a separate statute that provides criminal liability as an accomplice for any person who furnishes the quote unquote means for procuring an abortion, knowing the intended purpose. That particular law uh, is gonna be a very important law in Texas as we'll discuss because it's really open-ended. Uh, there's no real case law about wh what the means for procuring an abortion extends to. So it raises interesting questions as to, you know, whether that covers just the medication or whether it extends to someone who decides to drive their friend to, to a permissive state or who otherwise provides advice or encourages them uh, or reimburses the costs for them to go out of state. So what the courts will decide the means means uh, uh, is gonna be an important development in, in, in the courts. Now, in can I ask you a, a quick question? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, just a quick question. Wait, we had an outside question and I, I have a question I wanna piggyback on it. What, the question was that you mentioned earlier, the difficulty of charging out of state providers. And the, the questioner asks if one, it will be even more difficult for out of country abortion pill providers and with regard to your comment on the means, I'm curious if you can speak about the information. We have both domestic and, uh, and, and international organizations who are putting information out there about self-managed abortion, for example. And, and, and what you, do you see, how, how you think about that uh, in terms of uh, enforcement risk generally and in, under the statute? So, you know, generally speaking, I think any attempt to, to criminalize or create civil liability for recommendations and or providing information um, is, is, is going to run right into uh, the First Amendment uh, rights and also uh, general rules of medical practice that allow physicians, you know, a, a, a broad spectrum in terms of giving what they believe to be medically appropriate advice. So I don't believe that to the extent that you can characterize as the means being information or recommendation that, that there will be any successful attempt to criminalize that. And I think even the Texas courts are liable to, to put down a hard line that that does not cross in to conduct that, that is actionable either, either under the criminal statutes or the civil statutes. The, 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 the viewer's question about the um, difficulties uh, for prosecuting someone out of state, as we'll discuss in just a second, in theory, the, 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 the abortion ban state, to the extent, and I'm putting aside aiding and abetting, but to the extent that the medication comes from another state or comes from abroad, into an abortion ban state and is ingested and results in an attempted or an actual abortion. In theory, the, the person who sent the medication in uh, it, it could be held potentially liable under both the criminal and civil statutes. It's complicated by the fact that uh, in terms of aiding and abetting liability, at least for various providers on, under the chain, Normally, aiding and abetting requires someone that you're aiding and abetting. And in this case, most of the states, not all of them, most of the states expressly exempt the uh, pregnant woman from criminal prosecution. So then the, the question becomes, if there's no one actually, if the ingestion of the medication that, re, that, that completes the abortion uh, is done by someone who has no criminal liability, can aiding and abetting liability be extended to someone who provided that medication? That is a question that is going to have to be decided 
by the courts, but under ordinary principles of aiding and abetting liability, the answer to that is probably no. You, you need to be able to, you need to aid and abet a person in committing the crime. And so <clears throat> not criminalizing the pregnant woman's uh, uh, conduct is likely to put a significant obstacle in, in, in front of prosecuting uh, out-of-state providers or international providers on a theory that they aided and abetted. That being said, though, recognize that if you're looking at the old Texas law, and as we'll discuss in just a second, the new Texas law, the focus is on actually the performance of the abortion. And, and the, the, that definition of abortion includes prescribing or administering uh, a, a medication. So my view is, is that the abortion ban state is gonna take the, the, the position that, an, that a foreign organization or an out-of-state provider that pro provides the medication violates the statute to the extent any portion of that medication uh, is ingested in, 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 the, the, the state, in the abortion ban state uh, by a resident. So, or, or not by a resident, by anyone within, within that state. So the direct liability under the statute does attach at least facially, to the administration prescribing uh, 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 of the drug um, by an out-of-state provider, provided that part of the chain of conduct occurs in the abortion ban state, because it's a generally an accepted principle that you can't be primarily liable under a criminal statute for conduct that occurs outside the state, in this case, the abortion ban state. So if the medication is prescribed in a permissive state and the resident of the abortion ban state completes the, the medical abortion, ingests the medication and stays in the permissive state during that process, then it seems to me unlikely that the courts will conclude that the person or the providers can be criminally charged in the abortion ban state uh, uh, under that circumstance notwithstanding that the abortion involved the resident of their state because there no conduct occurred in the abortion ban state uh, itself. General, let me ask a question about that. Generally, you know, many providers are having patients administer the, uh, uh, take the, ingest the mifepristone uh, on site, but are, but since the misoprostol is uh, to be taken 24 to 48 hours later, there, there are many, many are giving it to the patient to, to take on their own later. And obviously the doctor, uh, the clinician can't control uh, where the patient is. Do you think it makes a difference to the provider liability if the patient remains in a permissive jurisdiction versus taking the medication back to a hostile jurisdiction? Yes. So if the resident, and, and, and that, that's a, a problem by virtue of the regimen, right? Because it's going to become pretty costly for the resident of the abortion ban state to not always, I mean, maybe they have a relative they could stay with, but you know, they presumably have jobs. So staying in the permissive state for the, 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 the second medication see, strikes me as unlikely. So you've got a tension between uh, whether the provider, you know, gives them advice about where they should take it, but the likelihood is is that the, the, the resident is probably going to return to the abortion ban state and then, you know, take the, 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 the second uh, medication. Under that circumstance, I, I would expect the abortion ban state to say, well, the ingestion of the second medication within the state gives us jurisdiction criminally and civilly under our uh, uh, abortion ban statutes to go after the people uh, who prescribed it or ordered it, notwithstanding that they're in a permissive state. Because at that point in the, in the chain of conduct, the, uh, they're gonna take the position that the abortion was quote unquote performed in the abortion ban state because the resident returned to that state. So, so I, I think that, that, that that's a serious, now, you know, I'm just talking about what, the, the abortion ban states are likely to argue, but that comports with the traditional notion 
that you can't charge someone uh, in your in, in your state with a crime unless that crime with, uh, occurs within your state borders. So they're just going to stop. The, they're just going to say it doesn't matter that the film started in the permissive state with an out-of-state provider prescribing and an out-of-state pharmacist legally dispensing. If in fact those providers, at least knowingly knew or you know deliberately ignored that the 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 patient then returned to the abortion ban state and completed the abortion in the ban state so that that is going to be a there's going to be a battle about that and um we can talk about some of the permutations about what the reality is in terms of you know what happens if you're sitting in new mexico or colorado uh, as is already happening in New Mexico, you know, that they're already backed up uh, with women from Texas and other banned states showing up in New Mexico uh, for for uh, uh, abortions. You know, what happens in that in, in, in that situation if the physician and the pharmacist are suddenly charged in Texas under the scenario I just described? What is the likelihood that they're going to have to go to Texas uh, to face those charges and what is the uh, versus never, you know, vacationing in Texas again. Uh, we'll discuss that shortly. Before we do, though, I just wanted to talk about the new Texas abortion ban. This one is becoming effective in a few days. It's what's called one of the trigger laws uh, that, that, that was triggered by any Supreme Court decision, in this case, Dobbs, uh, finding that, that the Roe v. Wade um, decision w was incorrect and overturned. And so this one is becoming effect effective uh, next week. And again, it's similar, but quite different from the old Texas law. So you've got some competing laws here that uh, the, the courts are gonna have to resolve what applies when. So the new, the new Texas abortion ban prohibits knowingly performing or inducing abortion resulting in an unborn children's death. And this one says that if it results in an unborn children's death, unlike the old one, this is a first degree felony punishable by five years to life in prison. But the definition of abortion, again, extends to the prescribing or providing of medications. So the, 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 the target crosshairs is again focused in on, on the people who assist the pregnant woman and not the pregnant woman herself because there's an express exception uh, again for uh, uh, that person in terms of any criminal uh, liability. I, I would also point out to the extent that an out-of-state provider has a Texas license, medical license, this statute also provides for a mandatory revocation of the healthcare professional's license. Uh, if they're involved in performing and inducing an abortion within the, within the definition I just described. By the way, there's a, one of the, there have been a number of questions. I'll save some of them for the end. But sure. one, one of the questions was biologically the process of taking Miffy and Miso. Um, but it's the, the questioner, by the way, notes they can be taken together at the same time. But um, but often the the actual expulsion of will of the pregnancy won't occur may not occur for days later or in some cases may not be complete for weeks. Uh, and is there an end point for the patient staying in the permissive state? And my, my general, again, I, my, my view is that the, the, the physician liability uh, for practice of medicine should end at the last time that the physician actually did something. But you're, take, you're saying that for purposes of these statutes, uh, we should take a more conservative view. Right, I mean, certainly I think that the providers will defend on that basis and try to stop the film earlier, but just based on the definition of abortions and this exception for the pregnant women, these statutes are deliberately targeting the providers. And in the context of, of, of telemedical abortions or medication abortions, the language is crystal clear that they're intending to equate the crime of abortion with the prescribing uh, of the, 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 the prescribing and administration 
of the medications themselves. So to give you an example in the context of controlled substances, right? Um, early on when they went after physicians as drug dealers, uh, the physicians often took the position that they were not illegal, illegally distributing anything because they were just making a medical judgment and prescribing uh, the, the, the control substance, whether it's hydrocodone or some other uh, uh, control substance that wasn't being used for legitimate medical purposes. And the courts uniformly concluded that the prescribing by the physician constituted distribution. So because the language of these statutes that, that criminalize abortion specifically define abortion as administering or procuring for administration a medication for abortion, the abortion ban states are, are going to argue, in my view, they're going to argue that the act of prescribing is an attempt uh, and to the extent that that one or both of the, 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 the medications is ingested, dispensed and then ingested by the pregnant woman, that that creates criminal liability, direct criminal liability on the prescribing physician for quote unquote, performing uh, an abortion via medications. So going back to what I said earlier about the legal battlefield, these, these particular laws obviously reflect the recognition by the abortion ban states that they're not gonna have too much trouble uh, controlling surgical uh, 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 abortions or later trimester abortions within the abortion ban state, but they, are, the, 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 they want to throttle the, the earlier medication abortions and equate that with, with a later trimester abortion. So that's where the battlefield is going to be joined, in my view. Now, the Texas Heartbeat Act, I alluded to this a little earlier, um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Harry, that, that Texas isn't the only state that has implemented a private attorney general statute that authorizes private citizens to bring civil claims and obtain statutory damages uh, against anyone who performs and induces uh, an abortion or aids and abets in, in, the, in, in that process. And that there's also like Oklahoma and Idaho, I believe. Is so that I right? believe that's the list right now. I don't know if anybody has in the chat has information about other states. I know that other states, yeah, Oklahoma, Idaho, and Texas is the current list, but I know there are a number of other states that are also uh, planning to follow suit and still in their process, legislative process. So the Texas Heartbeat Act uh, is named because uh, they, it prescribes uh, or prohibits uh, and, and, or targets any abortions on a fetus after they have a detectable heartbeat. But the important, the, the important part of this law is, is that it weaponizes private citizens in the enforcement of criminal laws by creating a civil claim for someone to bring a civil action against anyone who performs and induces the abortion of an unborn child and very expansively also knowingly engages in conducts that aids or abets such an abortion specifically including paying for or reimburse it, reimbursing the cost of an abortion through insurance or otherwise. Now that definition of aiding and abetting does not really comport with the criminal law of aiding and abetting, as I described earlier, because that requires aiding and abetting a person engaged in a criminal act. But civilly, it expands it out, and it also expands out the, the, the criminal definition of means to basically include you know, anyone that, it, quote unquote, facilitates uh, uh, the obtaining of an abortion, uh, et cetera. It is civil, though. It, it is civil, but the problem with this statute is going back to what I said about the likelihood of, of law enforcement who have got plenty of things to do on their plate about going proactive in terms of searching social media or trying to get hospital records of pregnant women to see what happened to their pregnancies and whether they all had children 
and following up. The problem with this private, adjourn private adjourn attorney general statute in Texas and other states is it allows people with plenty of time on their hands and also very passionate uh, beliefs, uh, anti-abortion beliefs, to get involved in doing those type of deep dives and overbroad uh, type of investigations to just try to identify anyone through social media that they think uh, had an abortion or is thinking about it and then go into the courts and, and file a lawsuit trying to enjoin the woman from traveling uh, and or obtaining uh, civil uh, damages if uh, there's proof that an abortion actually occurred. So these private attorney general uh, statute are, are particularly uh, problematic in terms of uh, the lightly enforcement. And of course, what will happen is, is that the trigger point uh, for the criminal prosecutions is, is also likely to come from these private attorney, attorney general suits and citizens who have you know, actively gone out to try to find pregnant women in an abortion state that have obtained an abortion. And then you know, finger, it's like finger your neighbor uh, to the local police. And once the local police has actionable evidence, but obviously the, the likelihood that they will open an investigation slash prosecution of the pregnant woman identified and the providers who were involved in that process dramatically goes up. So it's a sort of like law that I view, and this is just my personal opinion, the type of law you know, in to totalitarian states where you try to turn your citizens against each other uh, in terms of reporting uh, conduct that the, 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 the state wants to actively prosecute, ban, or prohibit. So I wanted to just add a couple comments, Mark. I know before I put up the slide on the Texas Freedom Caucus statute, you know, this we, we've been particularly worried about this because as you're just a, another way of saying what you're, what you're expressing, there's, it creates an unpredictability about the enforcement. It also opens up private financing and funders who want to uh, who to drive this as a uh, you know as a for political advantage? Two two questions that came in on this question of the aiding and abetting in the private citizens law. That there was a question of whether there's any risk for social workers or others who provide information uh, or your resources to patients in in states who are not themselves prescribers, and also a question about whether facilitating uh, um, travel. And it will, I know we're going to get to the health plan issue, but I I just wanted to comment. I, I you know per your comment before about the First Amendment right. When people are providing general information, it seems to me they're, they should not be at risk. But when you are actually, you know, going a step beyond that and actually facilitating travel or, or, or sort of helping people in the process, we see in other areas of healthcare, that's where uh, liability tends to attach. I'm curious if you have any thoughts. Yeah, so I, I, yes, I agree with you that if it's, if it's informational, uh, including information about Look, if you want an abortion, you go to New Mexico, Colorado. That that does not seem lightly to even if laws are enacted that ostensibly, you know, ban any recommendations, information flow, et cetera. Those the, the, those types of prosecutions or civil lawsuits are going to run run afoul of the First Amendment, and I I think the the risk of a successful uh, prosecution uh, of a civil criminal action are, are low. That being said, you know, I tell all my clients that the, the problem is not whether you're innocent necessarily. It's what happens uh, if you come under investigation or are named as or charged criminally or whatever. That's a life changer. So you can't predict the innovativeness and the aggressiveness of, of state prosecutors and state legislatures in abortion ban states. But I do believe that informational uh, 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 choices or recommendations are, are, are not gonna survive a constitutional challenge vis-a-vis -vis a social worker, a physician, um, or anyone else. There is gonna have to be some type of conduct. Now to go to the second part of your question, you know, this is a letter we're looking at here, and I think it, you alluded to it in an earlier webinar, where Sidley and Austin, which is a major and reputable law firm, gets a gets a letter from the Texas Freedom Caucus say, saying that you know if if you reimburse 
uh, uh, the cost of your employees to go to a permissive state, uh, it's our view that you could be criminally held liable uh, for for um, the felony of performing an abortion under that accomplice statute, right? Because obviously, just tra just reimbursing costs does not fall in the direct ambit of performing. Uh, an abortion. So there's no direct liability for reimbursing costs for a pregnant woman in a banned state to go to a permissive state. So th the person who wrote this letter says, we've got this 1974, aka 1934 statute that says uh, you're an accomplice if you furnish the means for procuring an abortion, knowing the purpose was intended. I, I don't think that the means is going to be construed by the court as covering, providing a car, reimbursing costs, uh, et, 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 et cetera. The means, at least within the meaning of, of, of those criminal statutes and the new Texas law, uh, would appear to be limited to the actual medication, if medication was used, or whatever other means were used to actually uh, perform or procure the abortion, not you know pr pr reimbursing the costs, etc. So I, I don't. I think that that's that 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 the extension of criminal liability for just supporting cost reimbursement uh, or facilitating travel to a permissive state uh, is 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 not going to hold up. One of the other reasons it's not going to hold up. Um, which was alluded to by Justice Kavanaugh, is his view that a state cannot prohibit or interfere with one of its residents' constitutional right to travel to the permissive state. So th the view there is, is that, that as enunciated by the Supreme Court in numerous state, in numerous cases, you can't stop your, your, your resident from traveling to another state, either to get a medical abortion or you know, to go to the local pot dispensary, that there are clear limits on that. One word of warning about that though, uh, if we switch from Kavanaugh to Justice Thomas, whose his view was that you know, Roe v. Wade needed to be jettisoned because the right to privacy was a sort of penumbra that doesn't even exist in the original constitution neither does the right to travel. So there, if you read the constitution, there's nothing that has been said uh, explicitly mentioning a constitutional right to travel. So you've got a danger uh, with the current court that the, the right to travel might be subject to this similar sorts of challenges, but then you're talking about reversing, not just one case, you're talking about reversing uh, uh, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Commerce Clause, which is one of the bases for right to travel. So that seems unlikely to me. And so the interstate right to travel is going to largely protect um, um, patients that go to a permissive state uh, to, to obtain it. And you're not going to have criminal or civil liability attached to anyone that facilitates that travel. This is my view facilitates that travel or provides the means to travel. Oh, yes. There was a, uh, one of the commenters pointed out the Texas Heartbeat Act, uh, step, the minimum statutory damages is 10,000, not 100,000 is on the slide. Thank you for that catch. That's a good catch. I must've put in an extra zero. All right, so we talked uh, about we, out of state. We, we've covered some of this uh, uh, already, um, but generally speaking, there's likely no risk of liability for the, the out-of-state physician or the pharmacist if a resident of the abortion ban state travels to the permissive state and completes the telemedical abortion in that state for the reasons I've described. The resident has a constitutional right to travel, at least currently, and there's no conduct in that hypothetical that actually occurs in the abortion ban state. In my view, there is a serious risk, though, uh, for providers, if as we discussed earlier, the, the, uh, and given the likelihood that the, the patient goes back to the abortion ban state 
and ingests uh, one of the, uh, the abortion uh, medications. Um, as I mentioned, the law itself specifically provides primary liability for prescribing a medicine uh, uh, that is designed to cause the abortion, but that's direct liability. Uh, so to that, that extent, you're likely to see efforts from the abortion ban state to criminally charge the provider in the permissive state under that circumstance. The pharmacist dispensing is an interesting one because, um, you know, in the permissive state, the pharmacist is distributing it pursuant to a valid physician's order. So it's really unclear uh, as compared to a physician, whether a pharmacist who dispenses the medication in a permissive state will actually have any liability uh, at all, um, uh, even under a, you know an accomplice statute or an aiding and, and abetting statute. One thing I want to say about aiding and abetting, though, is that while I think the the the, the courts are going to put pretty significant traditional limits on aiding and abetting to require that you aid and abet someone, which which is going to be difficult. Um, to go after a pharmacist or anyone else in the chain other than the physician or other healthcare professional who prescribes the medication to claim that they're an accomplice. You can expect that Texas and other abortion ban prosecutors could rely on the general conspiracy law. So the general conspiracy law uh, would allow a conspiracy to procure and administer uh, a, 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 an abortion where everyone in the chain, to the extent that they had knowledge uh, that the medications were going to be, or were almost certainly going to be used for an abortion, they conspired to thereby violate the primary law that for the moment seems to be create prim primary dangers for the actual prescriber uh, or, or, or the person who administers the medication uh, rather than ancillary providers like pharmacists or anyone else. But the conspiracy law is, is, is a, a big weapon that does not have the same problem as aiding and abetting law because you don't actually have to prove that the, the, that the pregnant woman did anything criminal. Rather, the conspiracy can be focused in on a conspiracy to allow the prescribing physician to support the prescribing physician's violation of the law. So th th there's also an interesting question uh, that's gonna have to be decided about, given what I said earlier about the fact that, you know, you're likely to have um, uh, pregnant women arriving in a permissive state and not mentioning at all that they're from, in our example, Texas, uh, and say they're living down the street or giving an address of a relative uh, that lives in New Mexico or co Colorado. So I, in that circumstance, that raises an interesting issue that I think Harry has already discussed about, you know, what, what, will, be, what will Texas be able to claim uh, with deliberate ignorance versus knowledge in a circumstance where the prescribing provider in, in the permissive state makes little to no effort to verify where this patient is coming from uh, other than, you know, getting an ID. And even if the ID says Texas, the person says, well, I don't live in Texas anymore. I just moved here. So that is going to create some interesting issues uh, with respect to criminal intent because um, ordinarily, the, the location of the crime, other than for jurisdictional purposes, is not an intent requirement. In other words, under the, the abortion ban criminal laws, ordinarily, uh, you would only have to, to, to prove a violation that the physician intended to prescribe and intended to administer the medications for the purpose of abortion. So, you know, similarly, under drug laws, you can't claim that you didn't have the intent to di di distribute cannabis uh, in, in, a, in, in a state where that wasn't 
uh, legal because you didn't know uh, where the cannabis was going to be distributed. Um, so the location of it doesn't really inform the intent requirement. That being said, though, because you've got a situation where uh, medical abortion is legal in the physician or pharmacist's own state, Texas courts and federal courts down there are likely to require proof that such a that, that the defendant, the prescribing physician, knew, had reason to know, or acted in deliberate ignorance of of the fact that the patient presenting was a resident of an abortion ban state, and 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 therefore there was a significant risk, given the medication regime, that the that the medication would be ingested in the state where it's then where it's then a crime, and that also raises some very interesting issues about about what the providers in the permissive state should or shouldn't do with respect to you know documenting addresses locations etc the only thing i will say about that is you know i've never seen a patient intake sheet um, that does not list the patient's address uh, and oftentimes you know uh, the the photo of the id is is less common but at least the name and address is typically required. So you can expect that, that, that Texas prosecutors will at least claim if there's suddenly, no, you know, in, in, in this class of patients, no evidence or attempt to verify their location, that that falls on the deliberate ignorance side if there's any indicia at all that the patient may come from an abortion ban state. Just a, a comment yeah. here. Yeah, it's very interesting. In the, in the classic in-person brick and mortar practice, uh, checking driver's license or validating I identification was never a formal requirement if, to the extent that, that medical offices asked for it. It was usually for reimbursement purposes to verify right. who they were dealing with. Uh, in, in the, as I, we mentioned in the last webinar, there's been a move towards uh, requirements in, in, in various states to require uh, verification in some states, authentication, uh, and those words have different meanings. I think we're going to see quite a bit of movement mm -hmm. uh, on the part of different states, particularly hostile states, likely pushing higher requirements on the authentication of where the patient lives um, and, and possibly uh, permissive states being more liberal. But but right now uh, that we're, we've got a, a real uh, a checkerboard around the country of which, depending on which state you're in as to what the requirements are. Right. And I mean, look, as a matter of medical practices, forget the criminal and civil liability. There's all kinds of issues that go beyond the scope of today's session, because you know you've got you've got problems where you know, a provider in a permissive state you know believes that, and it was told by the the patient from the ban state, I'm going to stay here for a few weeks, um, so there's no problem with me going back to the ban state. But then for whatever reason, they end up going back to the ban state, and they have complications after taking the second regimen. And what happens then? You know, given the the the, the medical uh, state line rules of practice. They, do they call the, the the provider in the in the permissive state? Is the provider in the permissive state now that they suddenly find out that the patient has returned to the banned state and has complications? What type of medical advice they have? A, they have some type of duty to that patient, obviously. And on the flip side, you know, the patient is likely to call the physician in 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 the permissive state for help because they're not gonna want to, to call uh, a physician in the banned state because they may get reported. So the, 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 the permutations and the difficulties of this, both legally and as a matter of practice of medicine, it's gonna take years to resolve. I mean, just, the, the closest we've got to it in the past is, is you know, when, when you've got slightly the same situation with uh, adjacent states that have different cannabis laws, but then you're going back to slavery, right? Where you had you had states that that where slavery was illegal, and you had states where uh, uh, it was legal, and you had you, you had in the legal states lawsuits being filed in the states where uh, it, it, slavery was illegal, demanding the return of their property. From, from the state where it was illegal to the state where it was illegal and what did the states do about that? And that, that, that does raise a point that I alluded to earlier that I might as well mention now, which is 
you know, what happens? Let's put aside the hypotheticals. What happens if you get charged because the, a prosecutor fit, felt that the, the crime did occur in the state and that you aided and abetted its commission? What happens when they file charges against you as a provider in Colorado and New Mexico in Texas? And we've also seen some reactions to it. Uh, Massachusetts has already you know, passed a bill that says the state governments will not cooperate with criminal prosecutions of, of their telemedical providers or other providers. Uh, California passed a law just recently um, protecting California providers from the private attorney, attorney general statutes, at least, in terms of no civil liability for pro providers that provide treatment within the state border. This is also going to create all kinds of court cases because under the traditional view of state comedy in terms of good faith and recognition of another state laws, technically, the, the, the abortion ban state can send an extradition request to Colorado and New Mexico that under general constitutional uh, uh, law and longstanding federal law, the, the, the state where that conduct is legal is, is bound to, to extradite the person back, including a resident of their own state where the conduct is legal, to face charges in the banned state. And so, you know, I've seen a lot of articles acting as if, oh, what will happen is, is that, 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 that there will be no enforcement of it. That may be, but there are federal cases out there where in the past in different scenarios where the state that made the extradition request that was ignored by the other state went to federal court to get a federal order ordering the, the non-compliant state to extradite the resident of their state to face prosecution in another state. So that area of what's gonna happen if you get charged there is also a significant question because if the state is able to protect its own residents, then you know you just don't show up and you don't go to that state where you you might get stopped and there's a warrant out for your arrest. But if extradition requests are enforced by banned states, that significantly, obviously increases the the danger to out-of-state providers I mean, let's let's move on we, we've got one more topic to cover we do have a yep. bunch of questions and if people I apologize if people have to leave we will try to cover uh questions to the extent <laughs> possible so we're going to go a few minutes over mark do you want to talk about the risks for employers and health plans um as sure. the, the texas uh, freedom caucus threatened uh sidley and austin sure so just to be clear going back to the waiver uh, I stay away, even though it's healthcare law, ERISA law is its own language. And ERISA, so, but for everyone, is again, is the employee, the, the federal law covering employer benefit plans, including employer health plans, that is, uh, our belief is preemptive of many state laws. Yeah, so if you, if you this, Texas and other states are already implementing restrictions on health care coverage or reimbursement of costs um, for for telemedical abortions that end up occurring in, a, in another state, uh, thereby not necessarily violating in the law, but precluding the, the, the health care coverage of that. So if you are a self-funded employer plan, as Harry just mentioned, you fall under ERISA. And generally speaking, ERISA will preempt any state laws that attempt to interfere with the employer's decision as, as, as to coverage and will lightly uh, preempt it. But uh, if you're not an ERISA plan and, and if your healthcare coverage, if you're the employer, is from a more traditional uh, insurance policy, there is there seems to be little question that um, the state can pass laws restricting insurance companies doing business in that state from offering coverage 
of abortion. So it, 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 it's not at all obvious. Um, I think that in the case of the large employers that we've seen, almost all of them uh, are, are self-funded employer plans. So they've lightly got an ERISA lawyer to set this up in a way that will support um, a strong ERISA uh, pre preemption uh, argument, uh, exempting them from compliance with the straight state insurance restrictions on, on, on coverage. That being said, that's just a, an insurance coverage issue. So the question is, and that takes us back to the Sidley uh, and Austin letter is, you know, what prevents the state from saying, forget our insurance laws. We're saying that if you cover uh, uh, abortions or reimburse costs, that that's aiding and abetting. And we've sort of already discussed uh, the, the, the obstacles to that. But once again, uh, there's likely to be test cases about whether covering under ERISA uh, or covering um, under some type of reimbursement plan for your employees constitutes aiding and abetting uh, abortion and or um, uh, aiding and abetting and or conspiracy uh, to violate the abortion ban laws. So we'll see how far that goes. One interesting note, at least in Texas though, is that that heartbeat private attorney general law that specifically says civilly that aiding and abetting does include providing coverage and, and, and reimbursement of travel costs also says that none of that conduct can be charged criminally. So the civil statute seems to recognize that, that criminally there would be difficulties prosecuting someone criminally on an aiding and abetting theory, but civilly they, they, they're saying that that conduct is actionable even if you had no idea that, that the, the person was traveling to a permissive state for uh, uh, an abortion. So you wanna cover the final takeaways, Harry? Sure. Yeah. Just some final takeaways. And we do have a bunch of questions um, also. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, happy to cover this one. I've got to get my slide, actually be able to read the slide with all the things up. Um, so look, we, we hope this, uh, this webinar has been helpful for purposes of kind of thinking, starting to think through the liability issues. As Mark mentioned at the very beginning, we are really uh, at chapter one um, and uh, there are going to be a number of challenging issues, particularly this issue of residents in states with abortion bans, um, uh, uh, putting, you know, creating a challenge for providers with respect to their locations. Uh, there are significant risks here that we, we've tried not to sugarcoat for providers, employers, and plans. Um, uh, you know, if, if any portion of the, uh, per, of the abortion occurs in the hostile state, Although we do believe that the hostile states should not be able to restrict their residents from traveling to permissive states. Uh, I wanna get, we have a bunch of questions. I, I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but I wanna just try to quickly run through uh, a, a number of them, Mark. So uh, one of the questions was, uh, and this is from going back to the beginning, the first topic, um, that how, the question was, how likely is it that providers sending drugs from, a, from an access state, a permissive state, will um, we'll have the, the doses noticed by reporting requirements done in state, are access state keeping track of doses ordered by their state providers and how many abortions they report um, as done. I, I, I'll just make the comment here that uh, the, you know, we, we, there are a lot of questions about what information could be exposing providers to risk. Uh, it's a good question that the that medication records could actually, uh, you know, be raised, you know, it be, be accessible in these states. And hopefully, from my, from my perspective, hopefully permissive states will do more to protect privacy and prevent information like that from being uh, accessed. Mark, I don't know if you have any thought on that. Well, it's a good question because as we've mentioned, the likelihood of being able to identify the, 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 the mailed in medications from the mailings is impossible, right? So you can expect states to try to either go to the drug manufacturers uh, and say, you know, who got this? And then to try to go to the permissive state and hit them with a subpoena saying, you know, we want 
your prescribing records to the extent you have them of every provider uh, who prescribed uh, these particular drugs to someone from Texas. Those subpoenas, unlike the issue of uh, an extradition request uh, based on criminal charges filed by a banned state against the resident of the permissive state, those subpoenas are liable to be met with a host of objections, right? That they're overbroad, that there's no way of telling whether we're not just going to hand over every uh, prescription of these drugs because we have no practical way of telling whether the patients were from Texas or not. So I think that the, they will have difficulties and the manufacturers of the drug and the permissive states will generally try to, and probably successfully, be able to, to block some type of dragnet subpoena asking for for um, you know all prescribing records simply because it's going to be way uh, over inclusive with respect to um, other patients that don't reside in Texas. And generally speaking, there will be no way, uh, and it will be un crazily burdensome for the the subpoenaed party, be it the state or be it the drug manufacturer, to do that. So I, I do think that there's going to be some legal obstacles to any type of dragnet uh, information gathering by subpoena outside of the banned state. All right, so just a couple more rapid fire questions. Question was, can, they, can the Biden administration um, do anything about, it made an announcement it wants to enforce federal preemption on drug laws and creating access. Um, my view on this is that since states regulate the practice of medicine and the practice of pharmacy, it's gonna be very hard for the federal government to do anything about uh, the blocking of access and, and FDA authority over the drugs. Any thoughts on that? No, I agree with you. And I mean, but, but, uh, and, you know, that basically that's the underlying precept of Dobbs as well, right? Which is the constitution uh, doesn't allow uh, or create a right uh, prize view. And it's a matter for the states uh, to determine whether they view abortion as legal or illegal. And absent national legislation to address this, which seems very unlikely, uh, federal legislation, yeah, it's a, it's a traditional state matter as of now. Any thoughts on uh, minors? Any differences with minors or their use uh, of medication abortion? There are differences because you've got, you, you've got, I mean, I, I think I just read yesterday some Florida judge ruling that a 16 year old uh, female pregnant patient wasn't sufficiently mature to decide whether she wanted an abortion or not. Uh, and, and in Florida, I believe they have some mechanism for minors to be able to go in, but they have to go into a court uh, to provide that. Generally speaking, uh, I think there are differences in terms of criminal prosecution uh, of minors, and there's not gonna be much difference because as I said earlier, other than a handful of states that don't expressly preclude the, the criminal prosecution of the pregnant woman. Uh, otherwise, most of the states that have abortion bans expressly exempt the pregnant woman. So the, the pregnant woman, whether she's a minor or an adult, uh, has low risks under these abortion laws uh, of any type of prosecution. Any question? We had a que oh, one question that came up was, um, the, in, in the city of Austin, they passed a law called the Grace Act, trying to essentially decriminalize abortion within the city. And the Texas Attorney General has threatened to continue acting. My view on this, Mark, is that um, the practice of medicine is regulated at the state level and that it's going to be very hard for cities to try and, and take their own path as Austin has. Any thought? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there's no, they'll be out of that. That that law is, in my view, will be held invalid for that very reason. More interestingly, though, you've got district attorneys, whether it's in Florida or in Texas, publicly announcing, presumably be, 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 given their community, that they're not planning on enforcing the laws within their community. And you saw Judge uh, DeSantis's reaction to that in Florida, but you can expect 
some fireworks uh, between the interface of state law and the duty of individual district attorneys to enforce or not enforce that law with the battle lines drawn around the AG's office saying, you know, you, you're deliberately uh, uh, not enforcing the law. Uh, so we're going to do something about you being a district attorney as happened in Florida versus the district attorney saying, I'm not deliberately doing anything. I have discretion as to what laws to enforce. You know, I have a limited budget and my decision for my community is we're not going to be actively enforcing this law. So you can expect litigation about that as well, including litigation on by the under the private attorney generals with citizens suing district attorneys that for facilitating abortions by not prosecuting it. Right. We're, we're at the 10 minute mark. Just one last question I'll, I'll make a comment on and we'll try to, to the extent we uh, understand the questions, we'll try to uh, circulate other information. There were several questions asking about whether providers should put language in their charts to, uh, to, to disclose that they informed the patient to take uh, the medication completely in the legal state and uh, also that the patient, uh, whether providers should put an attestation to that effect, does it help, does it create more liability if, if people attest that they're complying, but they actually are not. My belief is that uh, we're taking a page, that these suggestions are good ones, uh, that they take a page out of the opioid uh, controlled substance uh, issues where the more that providers can keep create a record, there's a sort of fundamental rule in uh, medical practice that if you didn't document it, it didn't necessarily happen. You can't prove it as a provider. And so uh, having this language in the chart to, to, as to what you discussed with the patient uh, and attestations that affect, I believe, are helpful. I'll join with that, uh, with a big underline, because I think you're, you're better off facing the issue straight on, as opposed to saying, well, you know, I, I don't ask my, my patients where they come from. Um, to the extent that you have a suspicion or belief based on the information provided to you by the patient that the the patient has legally crossed state lines to seek legal medical treatment in your office, but that that equation changes if they go back across state lines, I would I think you should expressly document that you inform them of the risk that if they cross the state line, that that could be a crime and that for your compliance, you inform them that they needed to take the medications within the permissive state. Because I do think that that type of attestation will go a long way, not to, not to um, completely thwarting a, the burdens of, of a, a criminal charges being filed, but will make it extremely difficult for a prosecutor in a banned state to claim that you knowingly uh, administered or procured the administrations of the medication, knowing that that the, the medication was going to be ingested in Texas. Or okay, well, any well, other I, one, one very last question. We had we, one of the questions from an attorney on the uh, webinar was: Is there a risk for lawyers in protecting and uh, advising either patients uh, in um, in banned states or um, uh, you know giving giving legal advice in this area? We'll make that the final question. Mark, any thoughts? I, I think there is. Uh, I, I, I don't think we're going to get there quickly uh, because of all these other issues. But, you know, whether you're a medical professional uh, or a legal professional, you have to put the interests of your client or patient uh, uh, ahead. And, you know, what happens if the interests of your particular client um, or patient uh, end up, you know, violating the law, but within the context of your profession, you're going to give X advice or agree to prescribe uh, uh, medications that may be illegal in some state. So I do think that, that, that you have some risk. That being said, I also think that um, those cases, uh, at least on, on that informational recommendation uh, or advice, first of all, they're likely to be protected. Uh, by 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 uh, the patient physician privilege and or the attorney client privilege, um, so it's unlikely to see the light of day. And also, I think courts are going to be very reluctant to start interfering uh, with with those professional relationships uh, in this arena. 
Perfect. Um, we're gonna we're gonna end there. I know there are a few more questions. We'll try to circulate something. Uh, as always, we, I really want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today, and thank Mark in particular uh, for for jumping in and offering uh, another perspective on this. And uh, really grateful to everybody, and look forward to seeing you on our next program, which I believe is September uh, twenty one on privacy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.